Okay, so for the last couple of weeks, we've been taking a look at a couple of different things about Easter. We took a look at some of the symbols, you know, the Easter lily, what was Lent, where did these hot cross buns, where did this weird rabbit come from, and all these kind of things. And then last week, we took a look at the fact that Jesus did, in fact, die. So we took a look at some of these things where people actually sat there and said that he was actually hiding. If you picture that, you know, here's Jesus hiding in the bushes, like, give me a break, it's a little weird. Then the second thing is, there are people, supposed Christians, some denominations, who actually say that he was not resurrected. Which, again, is a little kind of a bit of a stretch, because there's a lot of proof for this. So let's finish up with this and take a look at the fact that he was resurrected. Now, first of all, the four Gospels at the start of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, known as the Synoptic, Synoptic Gospels, all have a witness to this. Four separate authors, four separate versions, but all say the same thing that Jesus was risen from the dead after three days and three nights in the tomb. So you have, first of all, four separate accounts, and each agree with each other. There's a good start. Then we have many different reports concerning his physical presence. So first of all, we have the first, the four Gospels that say, yep, that happened. Then, if you read the Bible, it goes on to actually elaborate on this and go into more detail. John 20, 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, this is just after Jesus was crucified, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, we know from last week he died. There was no question about that, right? With the beating he took, the crucifixion and everything, he was dead. No question. He came. He stood. He said. There's three things that a living person only can do. A dead person can't do any of those three things. This is the thing that's interesting about the Gospels. They don't hit you over the head. You have to just read slowly and carefully and see what words jump out. There's three verbs. Three verbs that indicate an action. And when you stop and take a look at that, a lot of times when we read this, we just read over it. But when you stop and take a look, came, stood, said. Very simple. It's no big deal. But it says a lot right there in that one little section. John 21, 1 to 4. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. This is now in a different place. The previous scripture took place in Jerusalem. This is now a second location. This is now at the Sea of Galilee. And he shows up again, appeared to them. He's with them again in a physical presence. Luke 24, 41 to 43. And while they still did not believe it, <laughs> because like these guys are human, they saw Jesus die. So they're still trying to wrap their heads around. They believe, they, they believe who he is. But to actually still, yeah, I'm with this 100%. This is taking a real stretch of imagination. Okay, it's really kind of, you know, you put yourself in the same place. And while they still don't believe it because of joy and amazement, they're not afraid. They're really, really happy about this. He asked, he's talking to them, 
Do you have anything here to eat? Now this, again, just this, look at this little line. Do you have anything here to eat? If you were going to make this up, you'd probably do something a lot more elaborate. This is very simple. This is the kind of thing a person would do. If you showed up and started to meet these guys, hey, you got some snacks? That's what Jesus does. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. Only a living person can do these kind of actions. Appear in front of somebody, physically take something off them, and then eat it. Simple little things, but it says a lot. Acts 1.19, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him in their sight. So after he's got his time on earth, they're there. He's gone with their very own eyes. Are you talking about 11 crazy people who have the same hallucination at the same time? Highly unlikely. If it was one person says, oh yeah, yeah I saw him go up in the clouds. <clears throat> Two? 11? All right, you're starting to get more believability here. I love Corinthians 15, 6, in just this one little sentence. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of them were still living, though some had fallen asleep. This is very important. 500 separate people witnessed Jesus being alive. And that one little phrase, most of whom are still living, when this was written, that little phrase says to you, if you don't believe this, you can go talk to these people. It's not like a hundred years ago this happened and you just have to believe me because I'm telling you this. What they're saying here in this passage is that if you want to, verification, you can go and talk to, not one, not two, but hundreds that this happened. you got to be pretty nervy to do something like that unless it's true. Because you know that if it's not true, the word's going to get out and it's going to be just one big laughing stock. Luke 24, 15 and 16, and then 29 to 31. As they talk and discuss these things with each other, Jesus came up, walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? This is the story from on the road to Emmaus when he appears between for the two uh, apostles. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. Are these guys talking to nobody? you got to be able to talk, and they recognize who he is, so they're not going to just talk to anybody as if it is Jesus, it is Jesus. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at a table, sitting there with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Four different separate actions, all indicating the kind of action that somebody who was alive would do. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Now, in this case too, this is Saul, and I'm not going to read through this because uh, it's a little lengthy, but again, Saul, who in the Bible becomes Paul, is one of the most anti Christian people around. He hunted Christians. This, and he was very, very good at it. One day, Jesus shows up while he's walking along the road and has an encounter with him. Now, of all people, if somebody is not going to believe that Jesus is alive, 
It's going to be Saul or Paul. But instead of sitting there saying, I don't believe it's you, look at the last line. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. That's like some people who refuse to believe. I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. Well, how can you not believe something that's so obvious? And he was one of the greatest persecutors. So if he can be turned, if he can be convinced, we should be too. Now lastly, this is kind of interesting too. If Jesus didn't die, and if he wasn't resurrected, You've got at least, at least in the Bible, 11 psychos. Because in this, one, maybe two, would die for a belief that wasn't real. But 11, all of the apostles except John, died horrific deaths because they knew and believed who Jesus was. One of them was hung upside down and crucified. Another one had his head chopped off. Another one was stoned to death. You don't have this kind of devotion. And since then, there have been thousands of Christians around the world, including today, like in places like China and other countries, where people are killed. People are thrown into jail. Because they know the fact that Jesus died for us to save us from sin and to set an example that one day we would be risen from the dead. So there's no sense saying this is going to happen unless there is an example and here is an example of it. It's Jesus himself. Now the thing with this too... Remember, this is the key to Easter. The whole Easter message is wrapped up in this. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ himself suffered on account of sins. Once for all, he the righteous one, on behalf of the unrighteous, us. He did this in order to bring you into the presence of God, Christ was put to death as a human, but made alive by the Spirit. That's what Easter's all about. It's not the chocolate rabbits and all this kind of stuff. This is what it is, the amazing sacrifice that one man, one perfect man, who didn't have to do this, did it for us. What an amazing sacrifice. And if you want to remember Easter... This is one way of looking at what Easter means. Everything we have is because of, because of this one man who gave up everything. That is what Easter is about. And as you go into the rest of this week, think about this. Those of you who are Christians, think about what this means to you. Those of you who aren't Christians, Think about it still, what he did for you, and how much your life can be improved if you simply take that ticket that he offers you and says, why don't you get on the train and come for a ride with me? An amazing experience, a train ride to salvation. Incredible. And the cost of the ticket? Nothing. No hidden things, no tricks. It's amazing. So think about that.